Welcome to Your Gal Friday, a podcast about female leaders, innovators, and rule breakers. Each week, your hosts, Leah and Phoebe, will shine a spotlight on an amazing gal and talk about what we can all learn from her. Brought to you by Gal's Guide to the Galaxy. Welcome to Your Gal Friday. I am Dr. Leah Leach. And I'm Phoebe Freer. Today we are talking about a gal who defied a dictator, faced down death, and became a goddess to all of those who saw her in the ring. Bullfighting has been described over the centuries as indefensible and irresistible. It's with that polarity in mind that we look at the lessons we can learn from your gal, Conchita Cintron. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is going to be fun. (laughs) Oh, this is going to be fun. So Conchita was born in northern Chile in 1922. Her mother, Lola Kathleen Varel, was a socially prominent American with Irish roots. Now, her father, Francisco Cintron Ramos, was from Puerto Rico. In fact, he was the second Puerto Rican to graduate from West Point. Yeah. So after Conchita's father served in the United States military, he became a businessman traveling throughout South America. Now, according to the book Yankees in the Afternoon, an illustrated history of American bullfighters by Lynn A. Sherwood, Conchita was raised in a privileged lifestyle. Now, when Conchita was three years old, the family moved to Lima, Peru, and they spent most of their time at the world's oldest bullring, Plaza de Acho. Now, it would be in Peru that Conchita learned to ride horses at the young age of three. She was given her own horse at the age of seven, and she joined a riding school soon that same year. Now, Conchita's riding teacher was Roy de Camara, and he saw much promise in her as a bullfighter and started her training at the age of 11 for bullfighting. Like, right. that's crazy. 11. Wow. 11. Uh-huh. Like, this the thing is, like, 10 times bigger than her. Okay. Exactly. You know. My goodness. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> now, before we get into her training, Leah, you looked not only into the rules of bullfighting, but also its history. So, you should tell us about that, because you did a lot, a lot of work in this whole episode, and it's going to be a fascinating oh thank you i i really wanted to understand it and it was something that i was not familiar with and i kind of go with the thought of if i'm not familiar with it then i definitely need to make sure that i explain it (laughs) totally (laughs) so i thought hey i will take us down a slight but extremely interesting rabbit hole on the brief history of bullfighting now the origins of bullfighting they are highly debated however There is one fact that is very clear. It is an extremely old tradition. Now, while excavating in Kenosis on the island of Crete, there was a painting fresco found of a young man grabbing a bull by the horns and a young woman vaulting over the bull. And these paintings are circa 1500 BCE. So that's like really, really old, right? Now. That's pretty old. Yes. And bullfighting might even go back even further than that because, you know, human beings have been fighting beasts in one form or another since the beginning of our existence. So maybe even further. True, true. (laughs) But that's documented. So at least, you know, that helps with a date. Now, there are two aspects of the evolution into a sport or into a spectacle that would happen in the Iberian Peninsula, and that is modern day Spain, and that around 200 BCE. Now, the Celtiberians found wild cattle in the forest, and these horned bulls would attack for any reason, and they were relentless. They just wouldn't stop. And the Celts decided to gather these cattle and use them as a weapon of war. So in 228 BCE, when the Celts were being attacked by Hamilcar Baraka, which is Hannibal's father, by the way, the Celts released these wild horned beasts that were victorious. Now, also in Spain around that same time, there were the games of Betia. 
And according to Britannica, men exhibited dexterity and valor before dealing a death blow with an axe or a lance to a wild horned beast. The Iberians were reported to have using skins or cloaks, think of like a cape-like thing, to avoid repeated attacks of the bulls before killing them. Huh, it's starting to kind of paint a little bit of a bullfighting picture, isn't it? Interesting, (laughs) yeah. Now, both of these origin stories that were happening at the same time about war bulls and the games that the men uh, were doing where they were facing these relentless beasts, they started spreading. And the Romans and the Carthaginians were most notably amazed by this. Now, is that a coincidence that Roman gladiators were not a thing until they heard stories about bullfighters? I don't know. <laughs> oh, gee, I don't know. Interesting coincidence that there was no gladiators before 228 BC. <laughs> coincidence quote. Right. Dun, dun, dun. So, I mean, I like to think of the origins of bullfighting not only as war training, but also as a war deterrent. The idea that men who were brave enough to put themselves in harm's way for sport was almost a way of telling the world, stay away from us. Here, we fight bulls. I mean, that's a statement. (laughs) Yeah, that is for sure a statement. Right. (laughs) So it is a little bit, though, a bit of heavy, uh, a little of a bit of heavy dose of pomp and circumstance, though. It is a little posturing. You know what I mean? A little puffing your chest out a little bit. Uh, Which is why for over 600 years, it was the nobles or the aristocracy that would not only put on festivals uh, with bulls, but also they would participate in them. Rulers like Charles V would ride on horseback while assistants maneuvered the bull so that he could lance them. Basically, they were doing all the hard work and he was getting all the victory. Um, But. It's good to be the king, right? (laughs) Totally, yeah. So when the assistants then started getting more attention for their cape work on the ground, the aristocrats then became the ones on foot, and then the lowly assistants were sent on horseback. So, uh, of course, always a power struggle. Uh, Now, over time, bullfighting was in and out of favor, and it really depended on the ruler. The Christian church would try to stop it. The Pope banned it in 1567, but bull fighting couldn't be stopped. It was a very large part of Spanish life. The bullfights were community events, and it reflected the local and regional identities and traditions at the time. It was very interwoven into who you were in that region. Now, in Conchita's time of the 1930s and 40s, there was two major styles of bullfighting. There is the Spanish bullfighting, that is known for its matadors and its concentration on the ground with a cape and a sword. You know, the kind that like Hemingway wrote about in Death of an Afternoon, that kind. Totally. So that's Spanish. And then there's the Portuguese style, which is Rejano, which is focuses on horseback. Now, Conchita would do both. But she was first trained in Rahano and became one of the greatest Rahanadors. So this is how the sport goes. And it was a little tricky to learn this. The first stage is called the Cavaliero. And the bull is let into the ring. And the bull is attempted to be guided by the bullfighter's assistant with a cape. And that cape is usually pink and gold. It's not the red one that we're familiar with. The bullfighter then enters the ring on horseback and leads the bull around the ring, showcasing the horse and the rider. Its ability uh, for agility to escape the bull and also get the bull to follow it as well. The bullfighter then has three different types of lances, and they're varying different lengths, and they stab at the bull's back. Now, the bullfighter may not strike the bull if it is clear that the bull is not attacking them first. In other words, they cannot launch a spear unless the bull is charging at them. They have to be charged at first. So it has okay, to be a defense. That makes sense. Yeah. Right. So that is the rule there. So the goal is also in these lances not to kill the bull, but to show accuracy, to show good horsemanship, and to show bravery. 
That is the goal with huh. those. Yes. Because it's a it's a very big animal uh, with a very thick right. skin. And these lances, they look much bigger than they actually are. <laughs> They're like right. and that, a terrible bee sting, yeah. if you will. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you get irritated by a totally. bee sting, but it, it's, it's not going to kill you. It's just going to make you more angry. Right. That makes sense. So the second stage or the pega begins. Now, a forcado, which is a group of eight people, challenge the bull without any weapons at all they form a single line and they wait for the bull to run directly at them the goal oh, for the person my gosh it's intense it really is intense like i there's no way i was wondering what in the world was going on i'm like are they lining up they're lining up is the bull gonna get the bull is heading straight for them why aren't they moving it's it's absolutely oh, wow. incredible to move. So now the goal of this, because I needed to understand it, uh, the goal of right. it is the person in front dives onto the bull to avoid the horns, and it blocks the animal's sight, while the others, the other forcados, attempt to wrestle the bull down to the ground. So it's a wrestling match, is basically what wow. it is. Wow. With a bull. Exactly, with a bull. Oh my gosh. Right. So this is to show bravery and courage and, yes. Now, in the Portuguese style, the bull is not killed in the ring. If the bull is deemed too injured, it is brought out of sight, and it is killed by a professional butcher. That is the tradition. Now, some bulls are healed, and they are released to pasture, and they are used for breeding. That is the Portuguese wow. style. The Spanish style, the bull is killed on the ring with a sword and on foot. And I didn't like to say it any more than I like to see it. Mm -hmm. It was the hardest part of research for this episode. Now, I didn't want to watch these bullfights. I really wanted to understand these bullfights. Because if I understood why they existed, I would understand Conchita. So that was yeah, kind that of my methodology sort of thing. So it took some doing, uh, but I did get there. So for me, you kind of have to go back in time to when the strongest and most memorable way to tell a story was to have it acted out. And that's what festivals actually are. Uh, they are a recreation of a myth, of a story of ancestors and gods and historic victories. And for the Spanish people, recreating the story of the Iberians and their wild horn beast it keeps their culture alive it keeps their country proud and the story is immortal so the matadors of the country are heroes they are held up like they do in the u.s of like a modern day michael jordan or joe dimaggio that is matadors in spain it is a big deal <laughs> absolutely the problem is we don't celebrate by ritual much anymore uh we don't participate in many myths and so as a culture we've kind of stepped back also from killing animals for ritual and for sport. That's not to say it doesn't exist. There is still hunting season and there is still bullfighting. So it is a personal decision uh, of where you stand on bullfighting. And don't worry because it still splits the country of Spain in two. Uh, So you're not Mm. alone and it's very polarizing. (laughs) So I personally go with there was a time and place where bullfighting represented valor and bravery and country pride. And nowadays, we have evolved to show those traits in different ways. Makes sense. So for its time, it had a purpose. Nowadays, uh, it's really tough. Um, But Conchita's time, she actually sums it up quite nicely. She sums it up as a morality play. She says, quote, within a small circle, one finds life, death, ambition, despair, success, failure, faith, desperation, valor, cowardness, generosity, and meanness all condensed into the actions of a single afternoon or even a single moment. Wow. So in other words, there is a lot that we can learn even if we don't participate in it. Absolutely. (laughs) That's intense. Right. So there it's, it's a, it's thick and it's also very, it's almost intellectual in a very barbaric way. So it's an interesting, interesting sport. Absolutely. But now we need to know how Conchita dealt with all this. Absolutely. (laughs) So how did she get started? So when Conchita began riding at the age of, the, of 11, she caught the attention of Rejonador Roy de Camara. Now he taught her the discipline of Rejonadora, which is the bullfighter from horseback. Now, this is the form of bullfighting practice in Portugal. And 
Of course, it did not kill the bull. Now, she took it as more of lessons on horseback riding, which she was really a natural at. She was very good at horseback riding from a very young age, and so she just took this as... Kind of like an evolution? Exactly. An extension sort of thing? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, leveling up almost, I guess. Yeah, um, game up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they expanded on her already very talented skill level. And Conchita was not into killing bulls at this time. And she didn't really even want to at this point. I mean, she was only 11, so who can blame her? Right. Now, by the age of 12, she had her first formal bullfighting experience. But again, it was more in fun and it didn't involve killing. It was the other kind. The horseback, the rejonadors. Exactly. So, um, but just in case she did have to kill, she actually trained in that as well because her trainer was actually gearing her up for going on tour. And so he wanted her to be able to take on whatever was thrown at her. Mm -hmm. Now, according to the book Yankee in the Afternoon, the bull was a tool to demonstrate the agility and grace of the Rejonador's horses. Now, the more Conchita was bullfighting, the more she appreciated the beauty and the agility of the bull as well as the horse. So it was like kind of... Um, kind of like animal appreciation. Exactly, sort of like thing. honoring like, all of the beasts in a ring. Like human, right. horse, bull. Like It was just like honoring all animals that were there and, and seeing the beauty in them and seeing the grace of their movements and learning all the things from them that, that she yeah. said earlier. Now, she did begin training as a matadora as well, which is the, the form of when you kill the bull. Now, she was a quick study because she went on tour professionally when she was just 15. Now, she fought on horseback and on the ground in Mexico City. Now, mentioning where she toured is important because of the different laws and rules as well as the different kinds of bullfighting. So she didn't encounter any problems in Mexico City, but it will matter down the road as uh, Leah will tell us more about this. That's right. Yeah, because when she was training to fight on foot, then uh, Spain and Mexico were more open to her for tours. Um, at least that was the idea, because the draw there was more the matadors uh, and right. the matadoras that were on the ground. So in Mexico City in 1938, Conchita was not successful in killing the bull, but the crowds loved her and the critics were talking about her, so she was actually invited back. Yay. So on her next appearance, uh, the paper El Rondel wrote of her, quote, she was more a phenomenon in the truest sense of the word than all of the Belmontes. And the Belmontes are who Hemingway wrote about, by the way, and they were like super famous. Wow. Uh, that have ever been or are to come. Don't you think it extraordinary that this little girl of 15 who looked like as if she was made of porcelain, not only fought like an angel, but was an expert horsewoman and a first-class rejonador. That's what they said about her yeah, first appearance. I love that <laughs> quote. I just love it. Right. She's an angel, mm -hmm. but she's also an expert. <laughs> right. And she's also That's a amazing. girl, and she's also fighting bulls. It's like, oh my yes. gosh. It's amazing. Now, Conchita was not the first female bullfighter. Um, some say she was the first to be taken seriously. That's kind of okay, the, that you makes know, sense. as far as the first sort of thing. But she ended up fighting uh, more than 400 different events in Portugal, Spain, France, Mexico, and South America. Conchita was so well loved, she became known as the Golden Goddess. And I even see some refer to her as the Blonde Goddess. I think it's a translation thing. Mm. Or it could be honestly both. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> yep. So, but not everything came up roses. On a trip to California in 1941, it's reported by the Los Angeles Times that America didn't agree with the idea of bullfighting. When Conchita was questioned about this, she said, quote, would a bull who would be killed in a slaughterhouse not rather die gallantly? Is it not better to give a bull a chance for his life, a sporting chance? Uh, now, there was some very inhumane practices in the cattle industry in Cochita's time, 
And absolutely none of them can I mention on the show, nor do I choose to remember them. (laughs) Oh, that completely makes sense. I don't blame you. (laughs) Yeah, they were really quite horrifying. Thank goodness I am a vegan. Yeah, exactly. Uh, But, (laughs) however, Conchita would kill over 750 bulls in her career before retiring at the age of 27. Wow. But you know what? Sometimes the bull was also the victor. So on tour, Conchita was witness to Juan Gallo, an amateur bullfighter, not yet a matador, lose his life by being gored by a bull. There was also a bout in Juarez where Alberto Balares was killed by a bull. And then most heartbreaking, in Portugal, she was on the card with the Canicereto de México, who was brutally wounded by the bull, and he turned and he said, Conchita, he has killed me. No, oh, oh, that's heart. so heartbreaking. I know. So Conchita was not without her injuries as well. While on horseback, she was gored in the thigh and tossed in the air by a bull. Laying unconscious, Conchita was carried to the infirmary when suddenly she awoke, broke free from the arms of the emergency medical team, returned to the ring, and killed the bull. Oh, yeah, that's our girl. <laughs> Exactly. She then immediately passed out and needed emergency surgery to save her life. Right. She killed the bull. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, and she made history because that's an incredible story. She was not having it. (laughs) (laughs) That bull was not going to get the best of her. So, yes. (laughs) Nope. Now, Spain was home to the most famous bullfighters in the world. However, Spain forbid women to dismount from their horses and fight on foot like the male matadors did. And even finding opportunities to just perform on horseback was actually difficult for Conchita in Spain. But her manager arranged for a solo performance in Lisbon, and the crowds were won over by her. Conchita had conversations now where people were actually willing to think about letting her have a high-profile performance in Spain. Oh, yeah. Exactly. It was, there was a chance. <laughs> so she first struck a deal where she could present in Sevilla on horseback, but she was not allowed to kill the bull. All right. She was not happy about this, but it loosened the rules of government officials a little bit. She was then allowed to fight on foot, but only in festivals and for no pay. Wow. So what she did is a lot of charity events in Spain, like lots of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, you know, opening up all those loopholes, you know what I mean? Yeah, as much as you can. Totally. As a gal should. Right. So by doing this, though, tons of people saw her and public opinion, you know, she created a fan base. Totally. Yeah, that makes sense. She was doing a charity. She was raising awareness for a a good cause. And she was also fighting a bull with no rules. She could be on foot. She could be on horseback. She could kill the bull or not kill the bull. The rules were hers for uh, a charity performance. Yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) Right. So the public really liked her and her power started to scare the Spanish officials. (laughs) So they banned her from performing on foot in any way. They were really scared. Yes. So now this all came to a head in 1949. And Conchita was planning on this being her last bullfight in Spain before retirement. She really desperately wanted to show the Spanish people what a woman could do in a major performance. I mean, after all, the Presidente, Francisco Franco, was in attendance. And Conchita was perfect on horseback. And she showed off her skills. She showed her accuracy and her bravery. She rode her horse over to the President's box and asked for special permission to fight the bull on foot. And she was told no. Whoa. Nevertheless, Conchita dismounted, grabbed a red cape and a sword from her assistant, and engaged the bull. And the crowd loved it. Conchita made aim with her sword and waited for that bull to charge. When the bull did, Conchita dropped her sword and softly tapped the bull between the shoulders, where the blade should have gone in for a quick kill. The tap of the finger instead of the blade is more powerful than any number of kills because it made Conchita different from the rest. 
It's what made her a legend. That's now so Now the awesome. crowd freaked out in applause. Oh yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, she totally threw them for a loop. It was amazing. The audience tossed red carnations into the ring and Conchita was arrested as she exited <laughs> the ring because she, she was breaking a couple of rules. Yeah. Uh, now the crowd protested though and they were on the verge of rioting before Conchita was pardoned and released. Oh my gosh. I love it. Oh, yeah. Girl made a spectacle out of a spectacle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. She proved her point. Yep. I mean, she she solidly proved her point. She very much did. Yeah, so even though she was breaking the rules by just being on foot, she didn't kill the bow but showed them she could do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, Orson Welles said of that day, you can't keep a lady waiting forever. And there came an afternoon when she decided that she had waited long enough. Now, Orson Welles might be more known for his work in film as an actor slash director slash writer, and his most famous work is Citizen Kane. However, when Orson was nine years old, his mother died, and when he was 15, his father died. So Orson traveled the world, and he was a bullfighter himself at one point, which is pretty crazy to think about. I never knew that. I did not I, know I'm that like, at all. Really? Yeah, that, that's I knew he was support. passionate about it, but I had no idea that he was a bullfighter yeah, at one point. Yeah, that's crazy. I yeah. would have never guessed. Mm-hmm. Now, throughout his life, uh, he talked fondly of the spectacle, but was never without criticism of it as well. Ba- basically, sounds like me in movies. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, exactly. I love it and I hate it. Yeah, basically. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it has good parts and it has bad parts, and I will let you decide what you choose. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Totally Orson Welles' theory on bullfighting as well. (laughs) I love it. That's great. Mm -hmm. So Orson wrote the introduction to Conchita's biography, Memoirs of a Bullfighter, and said of her, quote, Her record stands as a rebuke to every man of us who has ever maintained that a woman must lose something of her femininity if she seeks to compete with men. Which, this is a beautiful quote. I mean, it, it pretty much stands for everything. (laughs) <laughs> exactly he's like see no not true end of argument <laughs> exactly yeah i love it now in 1949 new york post interview conchita talked about the idea of marriage possibly declaring if the right guy came along she would give up bullfighting now she did say that she was looking for a suitable man who can, quote, dominate me all my professional life. I have been dominating bulls, and I don't want that to happen to the man I choose to marry. Which, I guess, makes sense. Seems fair, right? Yeah, I mean, (laughs) if that's how you want to be, sure, that's that makes a lot of sense, you know? Right? You need to be a really strong, sophisticated guy, because, you know, gal killed bulls for a living. Yeah, basically, (laughs) yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, it's hard to say if Conchita retired from bullfighting because she found a man to marry or that once she retired, she then met a man that she'd like to marry. Now, in the time and culture when women were defined by who they were married to, it depends on who was doing the reporting. Now, regardless, Conchita married in 1951. So Francisco de Castelo Branco was a Portuguese aristocrat and nephew of Conchita's teacher and manager, Roy de Camara. Now, when word of their marriage was spread over the Associated Press, it was said that Francisco was a lion hunter of noble lineage, which, you know, bullfighter, lion hunter... I mean, I guess that makes total men, sense, right? Yeah. I hope it's true. I do I mean, too. it sounds really great on a press release. It really does, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, they would have six children together and settle in Portugal in the city of Setubal. Yes. Now, while she was still bullfighting, Conchita was in one movie and three documentaries. Uh, the first was in 1940, and Conchita was only about 18 years old at the time. And it was a Mexican-produced documentary, and it was called Mujeres de Torren. In 1943, Conchita was cast in Marvels of the Bull Ring. It was a scripted movie where she played the lead character, and she was a fictional bullfighter named Rosita de Parata. Now, the film was produced in Mexico, but it actually had a good run in America, too. Now, in 1948, she was in the Spanish documentary that used archive footage called Toros y Torreses. Uh, 
And lastly, in 1951, she was in a French documentary called Bullfight. I thought it was interesting that it was different countries showcasing her in different documentaries and different films. Totally. So I think that's why she was so well known around the world is, you know, every country kind of like, hey, you should know about this lady. Right. (laughs) Like she, she participated yes. in different countries, so they wanted to share like their version of her. Right, exactly. They saw her and they're like, she is part, you know, of our culture and our heritage and our festivals. And yeah, exactly. So everybody kind of, you know, claimed her, which was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> now, after Conchita's retirement from bullfighting in 1950, her mother, uh, Lilo Varel Cintron, wrote Goddess of the Bull Ring, the story of Conchita Cintron, and it was published in 1960. Eight years later, Conchita herself would publish Memoirs of a Bullfighter. That was the one with the Orson Welles intro- introduction. Awesome. It's most likely, I'll bet you, that the truth lies somewhere in between these two works. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mom's version and her version, right in between. I'm sure that's where it is. Uh, it also could be why we got interesting facts while we were researching. Yeah. It just kind of depend on which one it was coming from. But they are also both very difficult mm-hmm. books actually to find in the United States. Uh, we weren't able able to get them here before the show, but they are available on Amazon if anybody wants to check them out. We highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. So in between writing, Conchita became known as a very successful dog breeder, and she started with Portuguese pointers. Now, these are medium-sized hunting dogs, and they can be traced back to Portugal to the 12th century. These Portuguese pointers, uh, they have one part of their origin is actually the English pointer, which I'm more familiar with. So the English pointers exist because... The Portuguese were first. Um, And this is because English families were in the region due to the wine industry. They would bring the dogs home with them and then a new breed. (laughs) Wow. But the Portuguese version, the Portuguese pointer in the 1800s were on decline. And so breeders actually brought them back and they retained their traits of their ancestors. And I had to read this because it's so hilarious. This is what the AKC says is a trait of these Portuguese pointing dogs. Quote, Their affectionate nature is so intense that the Portuguese standard describes it as sometimes inappropriate and inconvenient. (gasps) Oh my gosh, that's so (laughs) cute. Isn't that adorable and yet so... I just I love having a dog describe as inappropriate and inconvenient because right. it's like yeah no no I got that I got that no that so. makes makes sense. <laughs> In the late 1960s, Vasco Bensuad was a breeder of the Portuguese water dog, and for 30 years he worked to save this cultural treasure from extinction. Now Vasco was getting on in his years, and he didn't have any family that was interested in taking up the cause and keeping the Portuguese water dogs going. So he had a dinner with Conchita and her husband, and he bequeathed their dogs to her in his will. So Conchita took responsibility of 14 Portuguese water dogs after Vasco's death. She showed the dogs at exhibits and championed his work. Uh, She sold very few of the dogs to people and only to people she trusted. And she worked to build a name for the breed in America uh, before the 25th of April and the revolution of 1974. This is all such a surprising fact. I was like, I didn't see that coming. (laughs) Right, exactly, yes. Bullfighting. (laughs) She was a dog breeder. To dog breeder. (laughs) Okay. Right. (laughs) And very, like, it's animals, again, right? Right, And then also it's Portuguese. It's cultural. Right. You know what I mean? This is my heritage. Uh, This is my, this is my home. This is where I am settling, so... It's it's very, it's prideful and, you know what I mean, um, animal appreciation. Absolutely, yeah. So according to the RPP News of Peru, Conchita was honored on several occasions. In 1995, she received the Cultural Merit Medal in Lisbon, and in 2005, she was awarded the Star Cidel Exito, a distinction award by the International Bullfighting Circle in Madrid. Now, Conchita lived to be 86 years old, and she died of a heart attack in Lisbon, Portugal. Upon the news of her death in 2009, newspapers and bloggers from around the world told the story of the golden goddess who was fearless in the eyes of bulls and defied the rules of men. That's so sweet. Yeah, I was surprised at how many obituaries we were looking at. Yeah, that was Um, surprising. You know, LA Times, the Telegraph, the, you know what I mean, the New York Times, it was... 
quite amazing. It, it seemed just about everybody was reporting on her story yeah. when she died. It's crazy. Yeah. That leads us to legacy it then. Does, because yeah. it I think it's, you know, kind of a a, a resurgent sort of thing. But wh- what do you think her legacy, either that she wanted to leave behind or that she did leave behind? I think um, part of her legacy is definitely her culture, but it's really cool to me because it's more than one culture it's multiple different kinds of cultures that she kind of Mm -hmm. meshed all together which is pretty awesome part of her legacy was like it's hard to explain she has this very powerful way of um presenting herself to where you realize she's feminine but you forget she's a girl if that makes any sense at all Right, she's just a bullfighter. Exactly. At that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know. It's so it's so cool to me. She was powerful because that's who she was. Not even though I'm a girl, or she was trained as a person, as a bullfighter. She was amazing at what she did, and the rest was just, hey, I'm going to spearhead this for myself because I know I can do this, and there's no reason I shouldn't. And I don't right. I mean I've earned that. Exactly. Yeah. And I that's just really awesome. I, I think she did bring her femininity to a very machismo uh spectacle. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh it's very, very pomp and circumstance. Um there was now there was one video that I saw of hers where she's on foot and she's with the bull and she has the cape, and it's Conchita and the bull, and they're almost dancing with one another. Yeah. And they're like entranced with each other, with both of them. And it's like really weird. I can't explain it, but it's like the bull is submissive to her. Yeah. And it doesn't last long. It's like, you know, barely a minute, not even two. But there's this mystical connection and it's very gentle. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, don, 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 the thriller music. It's just, you know, it's almost like there's a deep silence happening between the two of them. And I... I clearly identify it as femininity and grace. It's that grace. And so I watched the men as well. And I looked for that. I looked for that kind of that grace and that connection and that aura. And I, uh, I didn't see it as much. That's oh, wow. <laughs> um, at all. I mean, I, and I, you know, I watched as, as much as I possibly could, you know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, it gets hard after a while. Um, but I would say that Conchita is like a bull whisperer where the others are a bull reader. They're trying okay. to analyze. They're trying to read the bull's move, you know, what the next move is going to be. Where Conchita, I think, would find moments, and I know it didn't happen all the time, where she would be so connected to the bull's energy, she would be in control of it. That's how it felt to me. Yeah. It appeared anyway that she was controlling it, that they were one in the same doing a little dance together. So, you know, uh, bringing that whatever that is, that hard to describe aspect, you know what I mean, of a, of a ritual really makes her stand apart. And I mean, uh, it is her gender that stands apart. Mm-hmm. But if her gender wasn't a factor, that still would make her a legend. Absolutely. I mean, just the fact that she could do that. Um, would make her legend. So, I mean, her legacy is that she did open the door for more women to be bullfighters. And for the people in those stands, though, she also showed them that women could stand and be brave in moments where death might strike. And I think the latter to the people in the stands is actually far more powerful. And I think it translates to more generations because it's it goes beyond time period, honestly. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Of just of just watching her sort of thing. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's an interesting one. Cause there's a lot of words I can't use to describe. Right. <laughs> Bull whisper is not even close no. to, you know, to what it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but what did you learn from her? Well, I think I learned from her that, um, you know, we, we analyze genders quite a lot in our society right like women still aren't Mm -hmm. allowed to do as much as men and stuff like that and I mean there's this fine line of like analyzing like judging genders and then analyzing them I I think that Conchita has um, taught me that it's okay to kind of analyze why being a woman makes her different at this 
Um, right. What gives you an edge, maybe? Yeah, exactly. Because of what you just said about her, it's incredible. And like, women tend to have this um, almost almost spiritual type way of going about just things in life in general. And yeah, and choices. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that really shows with Conchita. And it's very fascinating to me to watch in, in different, um, even different job scenarios. Yeah, no, I can see that. What I about dig you? It. Oh, dear God, Conchita. She taught me a lot for crying out loud. Um, I think she gave me a huge metaphor. I think she taught me to think of life as a bull ring. And to think of life's problems charging at you one by one, kind of like a bull. And with life's problems, you can fan them off with a cape, or you can poke at them, you can be killed by them, or you can kill them. And the only way to feel in control is to do this enough times so that it becomes like instinct, basically. Right. So, you know, because bullfighting, that was the one thing that really, really got me is bullfighting goes against every single natural instinct a person has. I mean, you're inviting a charge from an angry half ton animal. I mean, that's crazy and not normal. <laughs> You're standing your ground when the earth shakes from the animal's mighty feet and you're waiting for it to attack you before striking and or deflecting, basically. So it's the ultimate going against nature um, to kill a beast is even against our nature. Totally. So everything about bullfighting is against our natural instinct to even do it. Right. <laughs> but yet... <laughs> They do it. <laughs> it's kind of like life's problems and thoughts. They charge at you all the time. And do you let them encircle you? Do you run from them? Or do you engage them and deal with them, you know, head on? Right. And so I think Conchita taught me to stare down each problem one to one, to dance with it, um, to feel its energy, and then decide whether to either quickly end the problem or tap it and set it free. Aww. I thought, yeah, that's kind of what Conchita taught me this week. And I, there, there's power in all of that. Absolutely. And none of them are wrong. They're all powerful. So, right. Yes. So, yes, I learned a lot about bullfighting and life. I love that. <laughs> Well, that wraps it up for us next week. We are actually wrapping up sports scales and we are wrapping up the season. Oh my goodness. Yep. Season, two. season two. So yes. So join us for the big wrap up. And until then, we leave you with this quote from Conchita. Within its small circle, one finds life, death, ambition, despair, success, failure, faith, desperation, valor, cowardness, generosity, and meanness, all condensed into the actions of a single afternoon or even a single moment. For more information about this week's gal or to check out our previous episodes, visit galsguide.org. To support the show, visit the Gals Guide Patreon page. We love our patrons and offer exclusive perks and behind-the-scenes access for as little as $1 a month. Thank you so much for subscribing to Your Gal Friday.